Hello, this lecture is on scholasticism. Scholasticism was a system of argument and study that blossomed in the 12th and 13th century. It was a remarkable period of intellectual focus and development of thought that eventually moved to the university setting. An important component of the information explosion of this era was Christian thinkers using reason to better understand God. There were three important developments that led to the rise of scholasticism. New ideas of applying reason to question of faith, the growth of universities, and a focus on the teachings of Aristotle. The 13th century witnessed the rise of an intellectual giant whose prolific work opened the way for Western modernity. Thomas Aquinas' work had a profound impact on Christian thinking. He successfully wrestled with the question, quote, if reason seems to deny what the Christian accepts on faith as given by God, shall the Christian accord his reason priority and throw over as false what he has received through faith, or can he find some way of holding to both? There were several key forerunners of scholasticism. The most important was Anselm of Canterbury. Born in a valley of the Italian Alps, Anselm was a studious and pious young man who desired to join a monastery despite the opposition of his father. After crossing the Alps, he experienced the freedom to pursue his goal. In the year 1060, Anselm became a member of the Monastery of Beck, located in North France. His choice of this monastery was due to the reputation of his abbot named Lafranc, who later became the Archbishop of Canterbury. Anselm was a man of prayer, humility, good character, and he had a pastor's heart for the welfare of his flock. One historian writes that he combined charm with firmness, gentleness with strength, uh, sanctity with sagacity. Out of a sense of duty, he reluctantly became the Archbishop of Canterbury in the year 1093. What followed were years of difficult relations with King William and later King Henry I. On a number of occasions, he was exiled. And when he was exiled from Canterbury, he wrote on theological issues. On Anselm's application to reason to questions of faith, historian Justo Gonzalez writes, what he sought in doing this was not to prove something he did not believe without such proof, but rather to understand more deeply what he already believed. And one can see this in Anselm's writing. Quote, I do not seek Lord to reach your heights, for my intellect is as nothing compared to them. But I seek in some way to understand your truth, which my heart believes and loves. For I do not seek to understand in order to believe, but rather believe in order to understand. Anselm thought to go beyond simply believing in the existence of God. He desired a deeper understanding. To reach this greater understanding, he developed the ontological argument for the existence of God. Gonzalez presents a concise summary, quote, briefly stated, Anselm's argument is that when one thinks of God, one is thinking of that than which no greater can be thought. The question is then, 
Is it possible to think of that than which no greater can be thought as not existing? Clearly not, for then an existing being would be greater than it. Therefore, by definition, the idea of that than which no greater can be thought includes its own existence. Another example of Anselm's reason to faith is his treatise, Why Did God Become Man? His answer that Christ redeemed humanity by his act of obedience became standard in Western theological circles. In the medieval period, the measurement of a crime depended on against whom it committed. Thus, sin, or in other words, a crime against God is infinite in its import. But humans who are finite cannot offer the infinite satisfaction required by the majesty of God. Only the incarnation act of God becoming man could wipe out the sins of all humans. Anselm's analysis begins with his acceptance of the incarnation. His purpose of using reason it's to have a better understanding of the incarnation. Another important thinker who adopted reason to better understand God was Peter Albertard, born in Brittany in the year 1079. As a young man, Abelard thirsted for knowledge, but he lacked humility and social graces. His criticism of famous scholars created ill feelings. Lacking prudence, he had sexual relations with Heloise, the niece of a respected clergyman who chose Abelard to teach her. Heloise had Abelard's baby and the uncle, upset with Abelard who he had trusted, instructed hoodlums to accost and castrate him. The castrated Abelard retreated to a monastery where he pursued his studies. A controversial book was his Yes and No, which addressed 158 theological questions. His approach was to find ways to reconcile contradictory authorities. Scholasticism later favored Abelard's model. The first step was to pose a question and then quote authorities who had different answers. Scholastics went further than Abelard and offered an answer and solutions, demonstrating it was possible for all the authorities quoted to be correct. Peter Lombard was another major figure who was a forerunner of scholasticism. Born approximately 1095 in Italy, Lombard received his education in Bologna. He taught at a cathedral school in Paris and became famous for his four books of sentences. These, these, uh, this work uh, became, uh, were widely used, uh, was a widely used theological textbook in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. The first book focused on God, his nature, the Trinity, and predestination. God's creation is the focus of the second book, and the work of redemption through Christ is covered in the third book. The fourth book examined the sacraments and eschatology. Lombard's work raised important questions and explain them by drawing on the passages from trusted authorities. The work of the scholastics correlated with the rise of university, which was a gradual process. Most earlier learning had taken place first in monasteries and later in cathedral schools where teachers taught students liberal arts and theology. Students who completed these studies normally became clergymen. 
Leading cathedral schools in the 12th century included those in Paris and Cologne. The first universities took the education process an extra step. The term university described a guild of scholars. These scholars or professors organized the university where students studied the seven liberal arts. And they were grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. However, logic or philosophy dominated the undergraduate curriculum. The first universities included Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, and Toulouse. The largest medieval unit university was less than 4,000 students. The most famous university was Paris, where a student could begin his studies at the age of 12. The only requirement for entry was a knowledge of Latin. Upon completion of the four-year degree, a student entered a MA degree program that consisted of two years of study, a teaching assistantship, and a thesis defense. Only then could a student proceed to study law, medicine, or theology. If the student desired a doctor of divinity degree, he had to study the Bible and systematic theology for six years. The main academic exercises began with a debatable question for students who used the authority of scripture or an earlier theologian for their answer. The, the, the professor received many answers from the students. His task was to take these contradictory answers and offer a synthesis for the next session. Before students left their classes, they paid their fees to each of their professors and received a reading text with the professor's comments. Hard copy books were too rare and expensive and thus were not used. Typically, a student only owned one or two books. Much of the material they used was dictated to them by the professor. Theology was a serious subject and no professor under the age of 35 could teach it. At these new centers of learning, there was a renewed interest in the teachings of Aristotle. Scholastics attempted to reconcile the Bible and Aristotelian philosophy. For centuries, Plato was the great philosophical source for church intellectuals. Platonic philosophy was wary of the senses as a source of knowledge. When church thinkers turned to Aristotle, new and challenging ideas arose. Aristotle's philosophy provided a more empirical and naturalistic approach. In fact, unlike Plato's philosophy that hinged on eternal unchanging ideas, Aristotle represented an intellectual system devoid of God and the soul. Professors use reason independently of faith and theology. When the path of reason led to a conclusion at odds with theology, it was a problem that the theologian had to solve rather than the philosopher. In the end, philosophers reached a point where they contradicted traditional Christian teaching. Historian Gonzalez provides two examples. From Aristotle, one reasons that matter is eternal 
But this contradicts the doctrine of creation out of nothing. Also from Aristotle, all souls are ultimately one, but this contradicts the Christian doctrine of individual life after death. It was other thinkers who worked out these contradictions by offering an alternative to both the traditional Augustinian theology and renewed Aristotelian philosophy. The most famous thinker who offered alternate approach was Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas was born in the early 1200s near Naples, Italy. He came from an aristocratic family and each of his siblings reached high positions of distinction in society. His, his parents expected him to excel in the church and they put him in a Benedictine Abbey of Monte Cassino at the age of five. At the monastery, he demonstrated his inquiring mind and dedication to study. In his teenage years, he became interested in the Dominican order, a decision that his family opposed. They confined him in the family castle for over a year, expecting him to change his mind. He escaped to Paris where he studied under the D Dominican teacher Albertus Ma Mangus. Aquinas was a big man who was quiet. Some referred to him as the dumb ox. That is until it became obvious that he was brilliant. He began teaching at an early age, eventually teaching and writing at various locations in France, Spain, and Italy. A deeply religious man, Aquinas took his role as scholar, teacher, and writer seriously. He embraced a single-minded commitment to thinking, and his literary output was stunning. When Aristotelian experts sought to oust Dominicans from the University of Paris, Aquinas successfully argued that the experts that the experts based their arguments on a false interpretation of Aristotle. Aquinas' reconciliation of Aristotle with Christianity was impressive. The most noteworthy achievement was setting forth the relation of reason and faith in such a fashion that those to whom the Aristotelian philosophy was definite could feel that they might consistently remain Christians. His most famous work was Summa Contra Gentiles, which gave missionaries arguments to reach Muslims, and his Summa Theologica, an unfinished monumental work. Aquinas rejected Plato's position that ideas or forms were real. Like Aristotle, Aquinas believed that knowledge is based upon what the senses perceive. However, he differed from Aristotle. Aquinas believed faith is a road to truth. In other words, there is truth that cannot be reached by reason. Humans could know nature by the senses and reason and, human, and humans could be happy by contemplating God. Both nature and revelation came from God and thus they cannot be in conflict with each other. Aquinas is also known for his five proofs of the existence of God. Quote, the first and more manifest way is the argument from motion. It is certain and evident to our senses that in the world, some things are in motion. Now, whatever is moved must be moved by another. 
if that by which is moved be itself moved, then this also must need to be moved by another and that by another again. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, moved by no other. And this everyone understands to be God. And Aquinas continues the second point. The second way is from the nature of efficient cause. In the world of sensible things, we find there is an order of efficient causes. There is no case known, neither is it indeed possible, in which a thing is found to be the efficient cause of itself. For so it would be prior to itself, which is impossible. Therefore, it is necessary to admit a first efficient cause to which everyone gives the name of God. The third way is taken from possibility and necessity and runs thus. We find in nature things that are possible to be and not to be, since they are found to be born and to die, and consequently they are possible to be and not to be. But it is, it is impossible for these always to exist. For that which is possible not to be at some time is not. Therefore, it, if everything is possible not to be, then at one time there could have been nothing in existence. Now, if this were true, even now there would be nothing in existence because that which does not exist only begins to exist by something already existing. Therefore, we must admit the existence of some being having of itself its own necessity and not receiving it from another, but rather causing in others their necessity. This all men speak of as God. And Aquinas continues. The fourth way is taken from the gradation to be found in things. Among beings, there are more and some less good, true, noble, and the like. But more and less are predicated on different things according as they resemble in their different ways something which is the maximum as a thing as a thing is said to be harder accord, according as it more nearly resembles that which is hottest. There is then something which is truest, something best, something noblest, and consequently something which is most being. For those things are greatest in truth are greatest in being. Therefore, there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection. And this we call God. It's fifth proof for God's existence. The fifth way is taken from the governance of the world. We see that things which lack knowledge, such as natural bodies, act for an end. And this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way so as to obtain the best result. Hence, it is plain that they achieve their end not fortuitously, but designedly. Now, whatever lacks knowledge cannot move towards an end unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence as the arrow is directed by the archer. Therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. Aquinas was not an innovator in Christian doctrine, but his influence was great. One historian writes, by, by employing Aristotle, and by doing so in such a fashion as to make him a bulwark of the Christian faith, and by presenting that faith comprehensively and clearly, Aquinas more than anyone else of the four centuries between the year 950 and 1350 provided Christianity with a firm intellectual foundation. Well, the years that followed, the years that followed 
were not as secure. So when we get into the mid 1300s and into the 1400s, it's not as secure. We see a decline of scholasticism. And this came with the rise of thinkers such as William of Ockham. William of Ockham was an Englishman born about 1300. Ockham argued that the reason employed by the scholastics could not prove Christian beliefs. Ockham was a nominalist. Nominalism held, quote, that only particular things are real and that universals are merely words coined by the intellect. For example, terms such as city, animal, and church are concepts of the mind and only individual objects and events exist. Theologian Craig Carter points to the problem of Ockham's nominalist thinking. Quote, for Ockham, God is not the predictable God of Aquinas who could be counted on to maintain his relationship to creation on the basis of a, of a knowable moral law. Instead, God is liable to be anything whatsoever tomorrow because the only basis of his action is his total sovereignty and his utterly unpredictable will, end of quote. Carter sees Ockham's radical notion of God, of God's free freedom, veering, quote, alarmingly close to denying the intricate relationship between covenant and creation, end of quote. To conclude, the 12th and 13th centuries represented a remark remarkable, um, was remarkable for its intellectual creativity in the church. The system of argument and study called scholasticism gained great heights, notably the time of Thomas Aquinas. But there were dark intellectual clouds on the horizon. Thank you.